Topper, we've had a lot of people uh, interested in the last interview we did, and they've suggested to us that we ask some other questions, things they'd like to know, people on the net. Okay. Um, so if you don't mind, um, yeah. I'd like to fire someone else's questions at you. If that's, uh, firstly, you wrote Rock the Casbah, Joe wrote the words, but you wrote the melody as well. Yeah. I wrote the backing piano, the piano and the, the intro and the bass and the drums. I yeah. wrote the, the music behind it, but Joe yeah. went into the toilets and, and he, started and he came up with the words and obviously then just sang them to the backing track. So. Great, great. That's how the melody was kind of developed. Yeah. Having played and written in a clean state and an unclean state, how does your experience differ? Does it give the sound a different edge or focus? It's a hard one to answer. There's uh, good things to be said for both, yeah. really, you know, yeah. uh, depending on what type of music you're playing. But definitely, overall, if I had a choice, it would be to do everything clean. Yeah. yeah. You know, so. Is it Watroy or Simonon on bass for Magnificent? It's Norman Watroy on right. Magnificent 7. Yeah. Uh, clearly, Paul Simonon was an excellent reggae bass player. However, he's also always been an ardent non-musician in many ways. As a drummer who has such a close relationship with the bass player, how does Simonon rate as a musician? Great. I t I, we found out doing this recording these, this last year, doing this box set anthology, realising how much how vital each one of us were for the band. Yeah. And Basically, Paul on stage because he used to keep the beat because he used to play basically and, and, and power the music along, gave me the freedom to do all sorts yeah. of stuff across the beat and, and everything. If I'd when I on the couple of times I played with Norman, that was good, but it restricted me. So yeah. it's only with hindsight that you realise how vital each one of you were for the yeah. band. You know. Yeah. There are stories from Joe Strummer's friends before the clash telling of a man who chose to ignore them when he became Joe Strummer. What's your take on Joe? Uh, well, I can identify with that because basically when you joined The Clash, you had to get rid of all your old acquaintances, all your old way, yeah. your old way of life. Yeah. I mean, when I went for the audition, I was mild-mannered Nick Heaton with my longish hair, yeah. right? And two days later, I was Topper Heaton and I had short, my hair was chopped off. Yeah. Months later, I divorced my wife. That was yeah. kind of like, that was how you joined the clash. So it was very it, Stalin-esque. It took you off. It almost it stole you, yeah. basically. But I know that Joe was good friends with his old friends again later. Yeah. Well, just, just so it was that a period, Yeah, well, that, while we were in the band. Because you had to in order to do it properly, It was presumably. more than just a band. It wasn't just music. It was a way of life. Yeah, yeah. How would you describe the relationship between Mick and Joe? Gay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we'll let no, them they... take what they want from that. Eh? <laughs> no, like they were brilliant songwriters. Yeah, you yeah. know there was always a, a, an element of uh, chemistry within the band that was a hostility. But, you know yeah. there was an air, there was an edge around the. But there has to be for that sort exactly, of music. Exactly for that brilliant music. You know, surely all the, all sort of yeah. Sex Pistols are damned. They probably all had that. But uh, they we were all close, you yeah. know, and, and we, we were like a, a family. It was wonderful. A drummer is never really part of a band. What are your thoughts on that? I personally would say the other old saying is a band's, a band's only as good as yeah, its drummer. Exactly. And that would be your response to that, presumably. Well, yeah, well, a band is only as good as its drummer. Have you ever seen a, a great band with a crap drummer? No. Nope. Not for long. No. Exactly. <laughs> Um, how do you think The Clash managed to have integrity in their media roles of rock and roll stars? It became harder as we, as we got more and more successful, yeah. but uh, it was what The Clash we, what we, what was vital to us was staying close to the fans. Yeah. And yeah. you know, even right to the end, San Denise was a triple album for the price of one, London Calling was a double album for the price of one, the ticket prices yeah. were low, we had all the fans coming backstage. If we had a day off, Joe would arrange to do some charity gig somewhere. The yeah. fans slept on our floors. It was, like I so say... It was a very close thing. Yeah, it was a way of life. I mean, I said. saw Joe um, stand up for you once at an interview. Mm. No, when, I, when, I, when I'd been alone. sick. Yeah, 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 I'd been sick on a, an airport carpet. Yeah, yeah. And, and Joe the, stood up. I mean, he was probably furious at me, but yeah. he's, if anyone else attacked yeah. anyone, we were, you know... So we it's were like your mum and dad, you know, they might be... The last gang in town, wasn't it, The Clash? Yeah, yeah. How do you think The Clash managed to make all music that they attempted have such apparent integrity? Well, we meant it. We felt it. Yeah. You know, it was... Uh, we've been talking recently. It was very organic. You know, yeah, when you I weren't moulded by a record company. No, I mean. when I joined the band, the first album was just... It was a basic, like, punk album, you know? Yeah. And when I joined, I loved playing that type of, type of music, but... It was, I wanted to push it a bit further. Yeah. You know, it was, it was just, 
the, it just changed organically. There was no decision that we're going to try this, we're going to try that. We just go, like we were saying earlier, Spike, you go into a studio and you pick up, play, start playing the piano or pick up the bass yeah. or pick up the guitar. And, so you know, it's a whole a, a wider yeah. experience. And we were, don't forget, in, in those five years we were together, we did all those albums, like triples, doubles, we never stopped touring. Yeah. You know, we cracked the States, we cracked the world, we cracked everywhere, right? So no one had an opportunity no to had, try and mould you and do anything else anyway. We didn't have any days off, we yeah. just played music and... Were you personally influenced by the Clash's political stance? Uh, well, we were, I was of the left yeah. before I joined the band and, and when I first went for the audition I didn't realise that they were of the left either. I mean, that was, just, that was just a coincidence. The politics I liked of the band were, right, well we're, we, we want to be the biggest band in the world but we're not doing what the record company tells us. We're going to mm -hmm. release triple albums for the price of one, we're going to release double albums for the price of one, we're going to not play seat, seated stadium, we're going to have, you know, it was just, doing it, it, it was a real what? naivety about the band that was beautiful was that yeah. we want to be the biggest band in the world but we're not doing anything we're supposed to. We won't <laughs> do Top of the Pops, we won't, go, we won't mime in Germany. Did you ever do Top of the Pops? No, no. we won't mime, we wouldn't mime anywhere, we wouldn't mime yeah. in the States. We took support bands to the States, we took Bo Diddley, we did Lee Dorsey, Mikey yeah. Dredd, we had all, you know, yeah. And, and yet we wanted to stay in the best hotels and yeah. it was just, it was anarchy. You yeah. know, it was, um, but really, yeah. real anarchy because yeah. you weren't even allowing yourselves to make the most of it in, in, in a financial sense. Well, it was, sense. you know, the, the funny thing is, it's when, when the band split up, we didn't have an awful lot of money yeah. because we'd spent all the money on, on these ex extravagant tours and, yeah. and, and, you know, taking cuts in the royalties for releasing the albums and, we wouldn't, you know, even in Japan, we played five nights in Tokyo rather than a stadium. We played five nights in Paris rather than a stadium. We played five nights at the Lyceum rather than Wembley. You know, yeah. it's kind of all, all limiting, all costly expenses, you know. And all on, but all on principle. Yeah. Do you think they were right to sack you from the band? <laughs> oh, that's a difficult one. I can see why yeah. they did. Uh, there's been a lot of talk ever since. I don't know, I, I do know it wasn't down to my drumming. No, uh, no. Because th I've, I've heard someone sent me a, a recording recently of a, of a gig that was the, the night, the day I was thrown out of the group and the drumming's fine. Yeah. I think if it was anything, it was because I was becoming, you know, I'm now 10 years sober, right? Yeah. And I don't like to be around people who are drunk all the time. Yeah. It's, yeah. They're irritating, they're annoying. You know, I can see why having to live with someone who's constantly stoned or drunk isn't, wasn't very And maybe they were doing it for, for, for your benefit as well. No, I think there was there were a lot of reasons. Yeah. Bernard Rhodes was was you know wanted to didn't really want the band as the, where it was at the time. You know it be, it had become what I actually think as well was that a lot we had become everything that we'd set out not to become. You know we yeah. were successful. We were making great music. We were recording double albums and triple albums. And I to be honest with you, I think it got to the point where Joe wasn't happy and comfortable being in a band that was successful. Yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, so something I, had to give. Yeah, and rather than leave himself, he got rid of me first, and then got rid of Nick. You know, yeah, so. yeah. But that's that's by the by. You know, I'm, I'm glad today. I'm glad I got thrown yeah. out then because that's the band exploded at the top. Yeah, yeah. Which is where if you're going to explode, yeah. you might as well be. Yeah. Last one, mate. Last one. You gave the Clash their musical swing, an essential depth to their sound. How important do you think you were to the band? I was vital to the band on stage, yeah. vital to the band in the studio, possibly a bit superfluous out of those surroundings because uh, Paul was a really good looking one, Mick was a sensitive songwriter, it was his group, Joe was the front man and the political activist spokesman. And you had to be the mad, bad and dangerous one. I had to be one. mad, bad and dangerous, didn't I? Which just ends nicely, but you know, and as I say, with hindsight, I could see why Five years of someone being a bit nuts all the time would grind you down, you know, so. On behalf of those people asking those questions, Topper, thanks again. Thanks, Mike. Hi there, hope you enjoyed that bonus feature with Topper Heaton. We're hoping to do more of that sort of thing in the future. If you haven't seen either of our uh, interviews with Topper, please check them out there, plus all our other videos. Next up is John Moss from Culture Club, and please always remember to like, subscribe, and share with all your friends. Cheers. Here we are, we've got them here on this nice, contraption but it's gone swipe it there we are <laughs> firstly um i will swipe this again here we go swipe it again 
here we are. Um, yeah, yeah. Swipe web. <laughs> it's a swipe, <laughs> swipe wibbly web. <laughs>